Well, this moment, I want to talk to you on a subject that is not necessarily always a happy subject. It can be, but it can also be a, a little bit sad, a little bit kind of makes you want to be a little standoffish at times. Have you ever felt like you were hopeless? Have you ever been in a situation where it seemed all hope was lost and you really did not have anything else to look forward to? You really didn't want to get up in the morning. You really didn't want to go through the day. You didn't want to go to work. Don't look at me. Don't breathe my air. Stay out of my bubble. Have you ever been there? You know, I've shared this with you on a couple of different times and different situations and sermons uh, about some of the personal things that my wife and I have dealt with in regards to uh, the infertility that we experienced very early on in our marriage. And some of you may have heard this and some of you may have not, but as you can tell, our children are not biologically our own. They're way prettier than we are. They've got a whole lot better skin tone than we do. They are just gorgeous. We decided years ago, after many failed attempts at becoming pregnant, that we were going to try the avenue of IVF, in vitro fertilization. Now, for any of you that have never uh, heard about it, or maybe you don't have much information about it, or some of you may know a little bit about it, let me explain it to you. If I'm being transparent and blunt this morning, it's not necessarily a fun process. It's quite stressing at times. It requires a lot of the woman. Uh, when we were going through that process, my wife was forced to take copious amounts of pills at different times throughout the day. Uh, I remember this one instance where uh, the doctor said, okay, Mr. Rhodes, I need you to pay attention because you're gonna need to give her these shots. And I thought, okay, I can handle that. And I was thinking a little bitty needle. No, that thing was like that. And I'm not joking. It was huge. I thought, mm, she's going to punch me in the throat. <laughs> That's not going to feel very good. But we were willing to do whatever we had to do because we wanted a child so badly. And it was such a desire of ours. She took the medicine. Uh, I gave her the shots. Thankfully, she didn't knock me out. I'm sure she considered it a couple of times. But there were so many things that she went through, so many doctor's visits that she had to make. And it, it was a very strenuous and stressful process. And I remember uh, the day that was supposed to be the climactic moment where they would go in and um, harvest my wife's eggs. And it would just, it was, we would basically start the process of implantation and so forth. And it was an exciting day. And I remember we walked into uh, the fertility clinic that day and um, I can't speak for my wife, but I know me personally, I had this expectancy. I had this hope. We had followed the rules. We had done all the medicine. We had done every single thing we had been told to do. We had followed the directions, so hey, it's going to happen, right? Not quite. I remember we both went back, and we both had to have um, minor procedures done that day, and... I remember as we were waiting in the post-op area, the doctor came in and she had this putrid look on her face and she said, I'm sorry, this is the end of the road. There's nothing we can do. This is where the road ends. The way that I walked into the doctor's office and the way that I walked out of the doctor's office, and I'm not speaking for my wife because I'm sure she had her own feelings and thoughts, but I felt like a failure. The hope that I had coming in had been lost somewhere back in the operating room. The hope and the joy and the expectancy that I had walked in with, it was like somebody had stolen it from me, thrown it down, stomped on it about 20 times, spit on it, poured gasoline on it, and then lit it on fire. I felt hopeless. I felt helpless. I felt terrible, if I'm being honest. It was so emotionally and physically challenging. We were willing to do what we needed to do to get the outcome that we so greatly desired, but that outcome never came about. You know, our story has been told many times throughout the centuries, 
specifically throughout the Bible. There are many women throughout the Bible that had to deal with barrenness. And in today's time, I think there's more of a shame and more of a frustration on the part of the prospective parents than it is for society. Society doesn't necessarily look down on someone because they can't have children like they used to. But in biblical times, if a woman was unable to, and I've said this in other sermons before, if a woman was unable to get pregnant and to have a child, specifically a male heir to carry on the family name, she was looked down upon. It was looked down, uh, it was looked up upon her as if she had had some kind of sin in her life, that she had done something wrong, and this was God's judgment over her life. Now that we have the technology and stuff, we know that majority of the time it's a 50-50. Either the guy has the issue or the woman has the issue. But because of society back then, society focused on the woman. It was the woman's fault. She was the one who dealt with the embarrassment. She was the one who was looked down upon and talked about by all the other ladies as they were taking care of their children. And that woman stood there barren with no child whatsoever, empty arms. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there are those who I uh, literally that I know of that have gotten pregnant so quickly and so easily, it just wasn't a struggle for them. And that was such a frustration for me personally. When we know that a woman is pregnant, what do we say? She is expecting. There are even books, what to expect when you're expecting. There is an expectation there. There is an end product that you have in mind. And when that happens and the woman finds out she's pregnant, it literally gives her a new viewpoint, a new focus. Some of the things that she once did, she realizes maybe she can't do those things. Women abstain if they've been drinking alcohol before pregnancy. During pregnancy, they majority of the time choose not to drink. If they were smoking prior to pregnancy, many of them will choose not to smoke during pregnancy. There's an expectancy there, and the expectancy has caused them to change their actions, to change their outlooks, to change the way that they act and react. For the man, it's the same way. No longer is he going to be able to go out and do his thing whenever he wants to. It's time to stay home. It's time to put the crib together. It's time to decorate the room. It's time to paint the room. It's time to take care of the honey-do list. It's only a matter of time before their lives start changing. And so it shifts their focus. It gives them a fresh focus. Now, right now we're in the middle of our Christmas sermon series that we've been preaching for the past few weeks. And it's called, This Christmas, I Choose. And the last word in the sentence has changed every single week. The first, time, the first week that we had this sermon series, it was this Christmas, I choose peace. And the whole idea behind that entire sermon was when we give our lives to God, we are given a certain amount of peace. At Christmas time, we place so much focus on, I want this, I want that, gimme, 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 I want, I want. We went to Tennessee this past week on a little mini vacation, and every store we went into, my kids were like, Dad, can I, Dad, I said, shh. Peace be still. <laughs> it didn't work as well for me as it did for Jesus, but I sure did try. It's all about wants, wants, wants. But when you have a personal relationship with God, you are already given specific gifts. But that gift is only as valuable as your willingness to employ it. If someone gives you a gift card, oh, that's nice. Thank you so much. But that gift card doesn't have value until you go out and spend it. It holds value, but if you don't employ it, if you don't put it to work, it's worthless. And it's the same way with peace. God offers us peace even in the middle of the storms, even in the middle of the struggle, even in the middle of what we're going through. But we have to employ the peace that he gives to us. Last week, Pastor Jerry was here, and he preached, <coughs> excuse me, on the subject of this Christmas, I choose trust. And the focus of what he was preaching was even regardless of what life has thrown at you, you choose to trust in God even when it doesn't feel good, even when it doesn't look good. 
Trust is a choice. Peace is a choice. Today's sermon is this Christmas I choose hope. Now this morning you're going to hear me use the word hope. And I'm not talking about that little cutie pie right there because that's her name. You're going to hear me use the word hope. And you're also going to hear me use the word expectancy because the two are, are twin brothers. They're, they're very interchangeable. They are very similar in their meaning. But this Christmas, I choose hope. Things don't always turn out the way that we want them to. I walked into the doctor's office that day with an expectation that we were about to conceive a child. But expectations don't always come to pass. If you will turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 1 in the New Testament. Luke chapter 1 in the New Testament. I'm going to be reading verses 5 through 17. And just a little side note while you're looking for that. The first four books of the Bible, or excuse me, of the New Testament are known as the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They all contain a lot of the same information but it's presented from very differing points of view. Now, all of the stuff from Luke's book, from the book of Luke, we know uh, Luke a lot of times will include the stories from other people's lives that surrounded Jesus. Jesus' story is there, but we find out the many people that were around him and how their stories connected with his. And that's where we're going to be focusing today, starting in verse 5. It says, when Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. And as was custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. And while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him John. And we know that John would become John the Baptist that we know so well in the Bible. Verse 14, you will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord and he must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept wisdom, the wisdom of the godly. Now hold your spot, because I'm going to return to this chapter. Now, this revelation that the angel brought to Zechariah and Elizabeth left them in a place of expectancy. They had received the word from God, and they stood ready to receive it. They stood ready with excitement based off of what they had been told. But I can speak from personal experience that I'm sure after a while, and especially how Scripture tells us that they were very old, most likely past childbearing years for her, she had probably resigned herself that she would never become pregnant. She would never have a child. Zachariah had probably resigned himself that he would not be able to pass on the family name, that he would not have a biological child of his own. Things were not going the way that they wanted things to go. They had resigned themselves to a childless life. I dare say that at the beginning of the marriage, they had an expectation that this is how things are going to be. You know how we all are. We walk into every situation with an expectation that things are going to be a certain while, a certain way. Now, expectancy and expectation are two different things, and I'm going to get there uh, to that in just a minute. But just to give you an example, I walked in this morning with an expectation that the heat would be on down the hall because I come in way down there first. And I had the expectation when I got up to the other hall that the heat would be on. 
And then when I stepped in here, I had the expectation that the heat would be on in here as well. Why? Because these thermostats can be set and put on a schedule. I was the one who programmed the schedule. Sometimes Brother Gene takes care of that. But I know that the schedule is set. Now, there have been a few times that I've come into this church, say, during the summer. It hasn't happened in a while. It'll probably happen now that I'm saying something about it. But there was one time this summer that I came in, and y'all, I want to say it was like 80-something degrees, and the sun hadn't even barely come up. It just gets hot in the south in the summer. And I remember walking into this room with the expectation of, oh, it's going to be so cool. And I walked in, and that heat slapped me, and I was like, Satan, get out. <laughs> This ain't God's will for my life. It's too hot. I'm chunky. I need some air. And I began looking around. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. The battery had not died in the thermostat, so I knew it wasn't that. But what happened was two of the three air conditioning units that we have were not working at all. And I thought, oh, this is a trick of Satan. We got to take care of this. I walked in with the expectation that things were going to be a certain way, but things were not that way. You see, there's a huge difference, as I said earlier, between expectation and expectancy. Expectation tends to be like a dictation. You walk in with a specific expectation, a plan, how you think how things should be. A secretary will walk into the boss's office to take a dictation with the expectation that there's something that he's going to tell her to do and she's got to make it happen. You walk into every situation with a specific expectation in mind. You went to bed last night with the expectation that your alarm clock was gonna go off this morning. You also went to bed knowing that when that alarm clock went off, you were gonna hit the snooze about five or six times. Yeah. You felt that one, didn't you, brother? Amen. Amen. <laughs> that's, that's a hard working guy right there. Snooze, snooze. I do it too. There's a big, big difference between expectation. Expectation places limitations and boundaries and specific things towards a, maybe an object or an idea or whatever is going on around you. But expectancy is altogether different. Expectancy is a state of mind. Expectancy should come with a level of hope with a level of joy. Expectancy is standing in a place and thinking, you know, I don't know how this is going to happen, but I know God said he was going to take care of it, and I believe in his promises. But if you walk into a situation with an expectation of, I know that I'm in need and God is going to supply because he's going to make $600 show up in my checking account, and I ain't going to know how it got there because nobody else knows my account number, that it's just going to drop in there magically, and, and God's going to do this and He's going to fix that, and I call that gumbo God. You know, you pop in a quarter, turn the knob, get what you want. But that ain't the way that God works. When I come into service in the mornings, I have an expectancy that God is going to move in the service. <coughs> Excuse me. I have an expectancy that God is going to do a great thing in the service, but I'm not going to place restrictions on God and how he should move because by doing that I'm limiting him I have expectations when I go into a grocery store with my kids that they gonna act like they got some sense my expectations don't always come to pass y'all know what I'm talking about big difference between expectancy and expectation now by this point all of God's people had heard these prophetic words that had been coming forth for so long. They had an expectation of a coming Messiah that was coming to save them. No doubt in their minds they were thinking, this guy's going to come in on a white horse, and he's going to handle his business, and he's going to kick Rome's booty, and all these other people that have been trying to oppress us. And There was an expectation, and guess what? The Messiah did come, but he didn't save them quite like their expectations had set out. Let's get down to verse 26 in Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read 26 through uh, 45 this morning. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, now this is after she has become pregnant, 
God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God, and you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. Now, they didn't have texting back then or emailing. So this is the first she's probably heard of this. They lived some distance apart. Keep that in mind. For the word of God will never fail. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and she greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Amen. You could even take that word believed and, and change it up with the word because you hoped that the Lord would do what he said. Because you had an expectancy that the Lord would do what he said. I absolutely love this scripture, especially that last portion where Mary has gone to visit Elizabeth. Mary didn't walk up in there proclaiming she was pregnant. She just strolled up in there one day and said, Hey, girl! <laughs> Maybe not like that. But you know what I mean. When you go to see somebody, when you go to see a friend, a lot of times you just bust up in there, especially if it's somebody you're looking forward to seeing. Hey, how are you doing? She didn't have to say a word to Elizabeth. She didn't have to inform Elizabeth of anything. The Word of God says that Elizabeth and the baby were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, be careful because... Many of us, when we think of being filled with the Holy Spirit, we think of it filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in unknown tongues. Now, we know that didn't happen until the day of Pentecost, which would come after Christ had been born, died, risen, ascended, and then the Holy Spirit came down. We know that she was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the way that she was filled with the Holy Spirit is she began to prophesy. She began to know that Mary was pregnant in that moment, and Mary had not said a word. Mary had done what the angel of the Lord had told her, which was to go to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth immediately confirmed That's the right. promise. That's right. Immediately confirmed the word that God had spoken already, that the angel had spoken. I dare say Mary had an expectancy. She had an expectancy that she was going to carry the Son of God. Now, if you study Mary, many people will say that she was a young girl. Many people say that she may have had a little bit of age on her, simply because when you hear her speaking early on in Scripture, she seems to have some knowledge about her. So we don't really know her age, but I dare say at this point, knowing that she had not been with a man, but knowing she had had an angelic visitation, and everything that she had went through, there was an expectation, or excuse me, there was an expectancy there. She knew that the child was coming. She was excited about what was to come, but she also realized what was going on around her. She knew that she was going to receive the whispers. She was going to receive the finger pointing. She was going to be the topic of gossip at the water cooler or at the well. You know, that's what they had back then. Again, we have to be careful with our expectations because our expectations will place 
stipulations on God. Had Mary walked into the situation after the angel had come to her and said, you will carry the Son of God, she could have busted back and said, that's all right, but I need it to happen like this and happen here, and this has got to, and I need all of this right here. But the way that Mary responded is the way that we need to respond. Whatever you say, God. God doesn't care about our opinions. God doesn't care about the little boundaries that we try to place on him. God doesn't care to be stuck in a box. Lord, I want you to move this way. I want this to happen. And I want it to look like this and be beautiful. And he's like, if you only knew, I've got something so much better. Elizabeth had an expectation earlier in her marriage that she was going to have a child. But that thing didn't come to pass quite like she expected it. Because God had a better plan. God had something better. She had not had that encounter with God because it wasn't time yet. God has a perfect plan. God had everything set up just the way that it was supposed to be. Even when we look around us and it seems like somebody has walked up in our room and has just made a mess of everything and thrown this over there and blown toilet paper over the ceiling fan and just wrecked the room. God can still take all of that mess and bring something beautiful from it. Had she gotten pregnant earlier in her marriage? While childbirth is a miracle, how much more of a miracle was it that a woman who was past childbearing age is able to bear a child, is able to even conceive a child? Now, that's a miracle plus some right there. We can't place our expectations on God and expect him to move in a certain way because his ways are always better. His plans are always better. He has something greater for us. There's nothing wrong with having desires. There's nothing wrong with making plans. I'm a firm believer, as the scripture says, in writing the vision and making it plain. But guess what? I sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil, and I write out my plans, and I try to figure out what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it, where I feel like the Lord is leading me. And once I've made my plans, then I turn the pencil over to him. And every single time, he has a tendency to go back through and take that erase. He's like, mm, nope, that's not working for me. Nope, not like that either. No, no, no. I know what I'm talking about. You've heard it too. And a lot of times I get so frustrated. And I'm like, no, God, this isn't the way I planned it. I don't like it this way. I want the pencil back. And he's like, no, you gave it to me. I'm going to keep it. It's okay to have plans. But you've got to make sure that you give him complete control and allow him to move in the situation. Because when he moves... There's something beautiful that comes from the entire thing. Right. Something you never could have imagined. That's right. I never could have imagined that I would have two beautiful children after we had been through what we had been through in that doctor's office. If I'm being honest, I had given up on the dream that I had that I would even have a musical child. I had grown up in a musical family and I wanted that for my children. But I set that dream to the side when I realized that we would be adopting. And y'all, I have a son that sings at the top of his lungs on key. <laughs> he plays drums. He does all these things. I placed my focus on God. I delighted myself in him. I let him make all of the plans that he was going to make. I walked around with the expectancy, and then I let him do it. And in the midst of him doing that thing, he gave me the desires of my heart because I was delighted in him. Right. He knew my heart. He didn't have to <laughs> give me that. That was something that was important to me. But I was like, God, at this point, I don't care. I just really want kids. That was my heart's desire in that moment. Our expectancy in God can be secured by his character. I can have any one of you walk up to me and promise me that you're going to do something and I have an expectation that you're going to do it. 
But you could choose not to. But when I walk around with an expectancy in God that God said he's going to do this, this, and this, and I don't press any stipulations on him or I don't try to limit him and I just say, you said you would do it. Do it the way you want to do it. That's when he can step in. That's right. Do something great. That's marvelous in our lives. Numbers 23, 19, and this talks about the person of God and who he is. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? No. I'm sorry, I had to stop and answer that for myself. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? You can place your hope in God. You can place your expectancy in God. If he said it, take it to the bank. Mm -hmm. Yes. But if you place your hope and your trust in man, it's temporal. Man has his own opinions. Man has his own ways. And he doesn't have your best interest at heart. But you can trust the person of God and who he is. The psalmist David said in Psalms 27, 13, and 14, I would have lost hope, or excuse me, lost heart, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait. I say wait. He said wait three times in that scripture. Why? Because we are an impatient people. Wait on the Lord. Stop trying to rush your agenda. Wait on the Lord. Stop trying to make things happen. I know your child is acting like a heathen right now, and you know that God has promised you that that child will become a Christian one day. Let God work. Amen. Do what you can do. Pray. Stick a prayer cloth under the pillow. That's the kind of stuff my, my mom used to do. All that room up, the door frame of that door, do your part, but then keep your mouth shut and let God do what he's going to do. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Be of good courage. Don't be scared. Don't be worried. Don't let the anxiety step in because those things don't come from God. That's a trick of Satan to steal your focus and to take your eyes away from what he has already promised you. Wait of the Lord and be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. He will sustain you through that battle. He will sustain you. He will sustain you through that frustration. He will keep you from strangling your child to death when they act crazy. <laughs> and all the parents said, Amen. Amen. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait. I said, Wait. Wait. You can trust God. Amen. You can place your hope in Him. Amen. Every single time. 